Stocks finished flat in the United States as we geared up for an avalanche of earnings announcements after the bell, including stocks like Pinterest and Microsoft and Google and Mondelez and Starbucks and AMD. So we'll take a look at those. Uh, we also saw interest rates rising here today a fair bit before going into a Federal Reserve meeting tomorrow. Uh, that'll actually tie into our trade application example that I'll present to you at the end of tonight's video. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's April 27th, 2021. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into our description area to sign up for our email distribution list. We're also heavy users of Twitter. If you're not following me already, I would encourage you to do so. My handle is at Brandon Van Zee, and I really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related tweets. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's activity. And as I mentioned before, you can see here that we had quite the flat finish here today on the S&P 500, uh, about as close to break even as you can possibly get. It was finishing lower by 0.02%. Uh, so not even a full point on an S&P 500 index that is currently trading at 41.86. Uh, you can kind of see what that candle looks like up there, basically closing in the same position as where we closed yesterday. You can see the high label is still above yesterday's candle. Uh, so on an intraday basis, uh, we still have yesterday uh, as being the all-time high for the S&P 500. And I guess you could make that claim for the closing price as well, since we finished just a hair uh, under that level uh, here today today. I uh, didn't see much uh, a more aggressive action over on the Dow Jones Industrial Average either. You can see the Dow Jones did manage to finish higher today, uh, but like the S&P 500, let's just call it flat. It was up 0.01% in that particular case. Uh, the NASDAQ had a little bit more movement. It was down 0.34%. You can see what that candle looks like there. Maybe a little uglier candle there on the NASDAQ. And then the Russell 2000 was today's uh, star. It was up a whopping 0.14%. Uh, so again, flat session across the board as we geared up for a really big earnings uh, night uh, after the bell here this evening. And then tomorrow we've got our FM, FOMC meeting uh, getting going as well. So that could uh, create perhaps a little bit of volatility. We'll just have to see what comes with it. Uh, but for our purposes here in this conversation as to how we generally read these particular charts using that market forecast technical indicator, as you can see with the background colors of all four of our charts, they remain dark green. In other words, we have strongly bullish postures on all four of those charts right now. In the case of the first three, uh, the S&P 500, Dow Jones, and NASDAQ Composite, the green line is in the upper reversal zone, uh, and therefore we call it strongly bullish posture using that green intermediate line, uh, regardless of whether the line is going up or down. Now in today's case, all three of them happen to be rising, so that's not really a question regardless. But uh, even on the days where that line might be falling, if it's still above 80, we would still consider that to be strongly bullish. The Russell 2000 is the one that looks a little bit different in f as far as where its placement of the, of the green line is. In this case, uh, we're not in the upper reversal zone like we are with the other three, but there has been significant progress being made on the Russell 2000. Uh, as you can see that this green line has now risen up here above the 50th percentile. It's at 64 and rising right now. So that bearish trade that I had done a couple weeks back regarding the small caps really isn't panning out too well uh, so far. That's okay, we're not gonna win them all. In fact, uh, maybe just offset a winner that we did have today for those of you that took the uh, Winnebago trade, uh, swing trade, the bullish one uh, here not so long ago in the presentation today, as you might've seen in a Telegram app, uh, we were able to successfully close that at max gain. So who knows, maybe we end up losing this bearish bet on the Russell 2000, but uh, one thing that we'll wanna be on the lookout for is, you know, where do we kind of top out here? This is a little bit more of a kind of a, a doji looking type of a candle right there where it's a little bit, um, you know, there, there's there's some conflict there. There's, there's bulls and bears trying to duke it out there uh, in the middle of today's candle. We didn't close at the high. We didn't close at the low. We kind of closed in the middle of the range where we were trading. And it just so happens that where we're sitting right now on the Russell 2000 is nearly exactly 
where we had this left shoulder being formed in this formation. Um, whether that plays out or not is anybody's guess. Uh, right now, things are looking more bullish than they were a week or two ago for the Russell 2000. But if we had some sort of a major give back tomorrow, who knows if, if that you know stems from whatever gets said in the, in the FOMC meeting or for any other reason, um, if this did fall tomorrow, then we might look back in history and say, oh, well, that kind of looked like maybe the right shoulder of this head and shoulders formation. Maybe this is the head. Maybe that's the left shoulder. And maybe this is going to be where that right shoulder rolls over. Hard to say at this point, uh, but just something to kind of put in the back of your mind uh, to look out for if that does unfold. Right now, there's a little bit of an indecision day there with us closing in the middle of the range, but uh, admittedly, things do look quite a bit stronger in the Russell 2000 today than they did a week or two ago. So uh, it is what it is, but it does look like the other indices were willing to pull up those small caps with them. Now, keep in mind, we're here at the end of April. Remember, April traditionally Additionally, is a strong month for the stock market, generally speaking, right? You guys that follow me on Twitter would have known that. I uh, posted that right away at the beginning of this month that uh, April actually has the best uh, monthly returns. I think it was in the S&P 500 and second best uh, monthly returns in the NASDAQ composite going back over the last several decades. So now that we're wrapping up April, the question is, well, what's next? Uh, many of you have heard the phrase, sell in May and go away. Now, admittedly, that particular phrase has not worked out all that well uh, over the years uh, here more recently. Uh, but throughout history, it does tend to be the case that most of the stock market's gains are made between November 1st and April 30th. And usually what you have in the six months that are not in between that zone is basically flat performance. Um, Sam Stovall over at S&P, or at least he used to be over at S&P, uh, does a great job with that type of research. And I remember being at a presentation uh, where, with him once upon a time uh, where uh, I remember him saying something along the lines of, you know, the, the idea of actually going away in the stock market is, is hard for a lot of people to swallow. And I could certainly agree with that. You kind of get addicted to this business. So, you know, just going away for, for, for six months might be difficult for some folks. What he uh, proposed was kind of a slight alternative to that. And instead of just going completely away from the stock market uh, until uh, the end of October, uh, he suggested maybe going into a more defensive area like the consumer staples. And his research had shown that over the years, had you done kind of a swapping technique where you went from um, going into the technology sector from November 1st until April 30th, and then swap that position into the consumer staples sector from May 1st until um, October 31st, that your results would have been quite satisfactory over the years. So, you know, keep that in the back of your mind as well. Each year is different, but having an understanding of historical occurrences is also important because it helps you set expectations as far as what types of trades you might be willing to put on. But at this moment in time, we do have strongly bullish postures on all four of these charts. The Russell 2000 is still more of a flattish type of a chart where there's still that possibility of, an, uh, of a head and shoulders pattern that we have to contend with here, but it is good to see them kind of rebounding more recently. Another thing I should point out real quick is that we do have um, bullish intermediate confirmation signals on the S&P 500 and on the NASDAQ composite. Remember that signal exists when we have a green line that is considered bullish. And remember if it's in the upper reversal zone, it's considered bullish. It's also considered bullish when it's rising between 20 and 80, like it was back here in early April. So that's step number one, identify the bullish intermediate posture. Step number two is requiring that the red line is in the lower reversal zone. So that one can't just simply be falling between 80 and 20. It actually has to be in the lower reversal zone. And you can see in both of these cases with the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite, that is the case as uh, the red momentum line fell to 14 on the S&P 500 today and fell to 17 on the NASDAQ composite. Now remember, the bullish intermediate confirmation signal is really a buy the dip signal. It's a recognition that the intermediate trend is still strong, which is what the green line is telling us, combined with a momentary pullback in price created by that 
red line, or at least that's what the red line is telling us. Now, we do have ways to further refine that particular indicator or uh, trade setup, and some of them will be found in the more ideal form, and some of them will be in the less ideal form. These ones we would consider the less ideal form because the give back has not been very strong. In other words, what we look for is the blue line to be between 50 and 20 on the day when we have that bullish intermediate confirmation signal. You can see here on the S&P 500, the blue near-term line is way the heck up here, 88. It's in the upper reversal zone, so it's nowhere near you know, closing below 50. You can also see that's the case down below with the NASDAQ composite. Its near-term line is still in the upper reversal zone at 85. So what that's telling us is that, yes, we did close you know, a little bit lower on a one-day basis, but there hasn't been a major exhale here where you feel really good about buying the quote-unquote dip in this case. Um, so you might have another day or two of uh, stock pressure in, in front of you before you feel a little bit more confident that you're getting good value out of where you're, you're purchasing your shares. But uh, because it exists, I thought I would at least point it out, uh, even though it would be considered the less ideal nature in this particular case. Let's take a look now at um, our next chart setup, which will be our three green arrows chart setup. This will be chart 4D here. And as we're looking at this particular chart setup, only the Russell 2000 has the three green arrow signal right now. And so on this chart 4D, remember that the background color will tell us whether we have three green arrows, three red arrows, or a mix of green and red arrows. And in this case, we have a three green arrow signal on the Russell 2000 because we have a green background color, whereas the other three charts have a white background color telling us that we have a mix of green and red arrows. Um, so with the Russell 2000 rebounding so strongly uh, since April 20th right there, we've gone up pretty much in a straight line over that time period over the past week. Um, there's been enough oomph in that price action to push that MACD histogram and the stochastics higher. So um, it's a little bit of a unique situation here where we do have a three green arrow signal on the Russell 2000, but I, I don't look at this particular signal the way that I normally would. In other words, Usually what we're looking for out of the three green arrow signal is to try to identify when we have better trend trading setups or not. Um, and usually if you have three green arrow signals, your trend trading conditions are more ideal. We have strong market momentum behind those decisions. Well, in this particular case, that momentum actually came from a pretty low level. And so this is a chart that strangely enough does have three green arrows, but it actually has a falling 30-day moving average. Normally you don't see that. What you like to see is three green arrows on rising moving averages. That gives you the sense that you have some of the longer term trends in place uh, in addition to anything that's happening in the short term as well. So I would, I would call that conflicting at best in this particular case with the Russell 2000 having our three green arrows signal of the bunch here. Uh, let's go through a, a few of the earnings announcements. I don't do, do this traditionally, but because this is one of the biggest earnings days of the entire uh, quarter, we have some major players coming out with earnings after hours here tonight, and this can give you kind of some insight as to um, uh, which ones are going to be up or down in the after hours session. And again, here's Winnebago mentioned before. We closed down that position uh, here earlier today at max gain. Uh, so congratulations to those of you who took that particular trade. Uh, let's go ahead and see uh, who was first on the board. And one of the first uh, companies that came out with earnings after hours was Google slash Alphabet. And this thing is just crushing it after hours. Uh, it's up about four or five percent here. Uh, it's been an absolute machine over the years. Uh, I still remember when uh, Google uh, IPO'd. Uh, I actually uh, was working for a money manager uh, down in San Diego uh, at the time, and the money manager I worked for was considerably older than me, uh, and I was in my 20s at the time. And he asked me, you know, is this going to be a big deal, this Google, you know, because he really wasn't that familiar with technology. I had to show him a lot of different things when it came to computers. And so, you know, he was asking me genuinely, is Google a legitimate company? Because he, he heard all the hoopla and everything that went into to Google back in that time period. Uh, but he was not familiar uh, with Google as a user. Now, I, I don't know if he is today, uh, but at that time he was not. And it was relatively new to that older generation. 
And I said, yeah, it's a, it's a legit company. I use it pretty much every day. Now, how they make their money, I'm not entirely sure. Now, we've uh, learned along the way that they have uh, lots of different levelers to pull when it comes to their money-making prowess. And this has been a tremendously successful company, one of the, one of the greatest stories ever told in the business world. And so uh, Google, after hours today, uh, does not fail to impress. It is up here trading at around $2,400 after hours. Um, that's up over $100 per share as to where they close the regular session. This is a company that we do own currently in my top-down trend trading class that I teach on Mondays and uh, we've done really well with. Uh, another stock we own in that particular class uh, that uh, is not doing as well after hours is Microsoft. Uh, this is a stock we've done fine with over time, uh, but tonight is not its night. Uh, it reported earnings as well, and it's going the opposite direction as Google. It's down about 4% after hours at around uh, 253. Uh, it closed the session at 262, uh, basically. And so a uh, pretty healthy haircut there on Microsoft shares, but uh, do keep in mind the 52-week high was 263. Uh, we closed just $1 shy of that today. So yeah, we're giving back. Back, you know, um, you know, eight or nine bucks or whatever it is. Uh, but considering we're just at all-time highs, uh, it's not the end of the world. We're still far away from 52-week lows there. Uh, other stocks that reported after hours, uh, Pinterest really got 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 hit here after hours today. Pinterest has been kind of one of those exciting social media stories that has uh, kind of come to light in recent years and uh, has produced stellar results as well. Um, you can see here that tonight is not its night. Uh, it's down significantly. It's down about 10% as we speak. Uh, Pinterest closed the session at 77, hang on just a second, 77.58. Uh, it's currently trading a hair below $70 after hours. So pretty ugly miss there from Pinterest after hours. Other stocks that reported, Starbucks, obviously a well-known, well-regarded company. Uh, not a big move for it. It's down $2 per share after hours. Um, another company kind of in that same restaurant space, Yum China, is showing rather impressive results after hours. It's up a couple of bucks after hours, last traded at 61.30, and it closed the session uh, just a hair under $60, so nice upswing there. Uh, Mondelez is another company uh, that some of you would be familiar with since we just talked about it uh, here in recent weeks in one of my uh, dividend growth investing classes. Uh, anyway, it looks like it is impressing investors after hours with their earnings announcement. Uh, stocks up about three or four percent uh, in that case. And then last but not least is AMD, Advanced Micro Devices. And boy, oh boy, that thing is often running to the upside as well. You can see it's trading uh, just above 88 right now and the after hours session. Uh, and it ended the day at 85. So um, lots of movers here and we're not done. Remember Apple and others, Facebook uh, come out tomorrow. So uh, it is a it is a, an extraordinary week when it comes to earnings announcements. In fact, I think I heard on CNBC earlier that um, this was only the fifth time in history that all five of the largest market cap companies in um, the S&P 500 are reporting earnings in the same week. So uh, it's truly the giant of giant weeks that we have upon us right here. So um, perhaps there will uh, be opportunities that emerge, trade setups that come off of some of these earnings announcements going forward. Let's go ahead and stop on over here to the internet uh, real briefly. I always like to get a chance to say uh, thank you to those of you that help support this particular project uh, on Twitter for both David and myself. And remember, we typically pin these to the top of our timelines if you're looking to help us along. I appreciate the 102 people that took the five seconds out of their day to click like for me when I did the video there on Thursday. So thank you to Roger and to Tom and Sam and Amik and uh, Ayokipa and Brandon and Doug and uh, Sheila and Brian and AC and Carlisle and Greg and Sedona, Lucius, Irene, Tommy, Valerie, Fun Jonesy, AKJ, uh, Paul, Luke, Ron, Margie, uh, Carl, Kirk, 
Tons of you. And I'm sure there's tons I miss because lots of you do that. And I really, really do appreciate that. Thank you so much. It helps us uh, kind of justify the amount of time that it takes to do these videos. Not only do the videos, but remember, we usually take about a half an hour to 45 minutes just to look for the trade setups. Uh, and then it takes another couple of hours after the, the market is closed to actually record the videos and then uh, edit the videos and then upload the videos and then send out the notifications and the emails. And there, there's a whole series of things that go on for what is effectively a free product here that anybody can view on YouTube. So if you want to help support that endeavor and help ensure that it continues at this rate going forward, we ask Ask one simple thing out of you. Click like for us there on Twitter and thank you so much for that. Also, while we're over here, uh, some of you might have seen me tweeting about this earlier today. Wanted to point out um, one of the special benefits those of you that are premium market scholars receive, even in regard to this particular free video that we do with the market outlook video. Now, naturally, uh, David and I uh, teach four uh, trading rooms each during the trading week where we're all putting on our own trades there. And you, you might expect that we, of course, have trade alerts for our premium members for those classes. But some of you might not be aware that we also send out trade alerts for these free market outlook video trades that we do as well. And the benefit to our premium members there is that uh, you get to uh, kind of react if you need to, to what we are uh, sending out with those trade alerts, whereas everybody else that's just watching the free YouTube version of the video doesn't find out until after the fact. And it was a unique thing that happened here recently that I wanted to point out and highlight why it's really useful for those of you that are premium members to, to make sure you're plugged into our alerts that we offer you guys for our classes. And so I say up here, here's a good example of why premium market scholars pay attention to our trade alerts. Uh, Dorman, uh, which was a trade I did you know, a few weeks back, uh, was one of the worst performers in the market today. Now this was yesterday when I posted this. Uh, it was down 11% yesterday and closed at $99. Now it was actually down another buck today and closed at 98 bucks. Ouch, remember that was a bullish swing trade. And that thing careened yesterday after its earnings announcement by 11%. That's going to leave a mark uh, when it comes to a bullish swing trade because it could have easily gapped over um, your stop loss. Um, but I say Friday, uh, I sent out the attached alert letting our members know that I closed the trade at 112.20. And so um, you can kind of see what those alerts look like there that we send out using our alert service for our premium members. But I basically said on Friday, uh, market outlook trade application alert, we sold 100 Dorman at 112.20 and sold 100 uh, CLR at 25.77. Both of these were bullish swing trades, but they both have earnings coming out ne early next week. So I wanted to flatten the positions to avoid any potential gaps over stops. We nearly took a max gain on Dorman and took a small loss on CLR. So the point I'm trying to make here is not that I was predicting that Dorman would careen by 11% um, and we dodged this major bullet as a result of me staring into a crystal ball. That wasn't it at all. I just basically wanted to get out of these trades because I didn't know what was going to happen on earnings. And I'm sure glad that we did. As I mentioned, we, we, we dodged a major bullet there. We almost took max gain on that trade anyway. I was kind of kicking myself on Friday afternoon because I was like, ah, we're only like 30 second or 30 cents away from letting the trade close organically at our max gain anyway. But I decided to pull the plug on it just because I didn't want to take that risk going into an earnings announcement. So wanted to share that example with you. Uh, in case you're not on Twitter, uh, just to remind those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars, take advantage of all your resources. And if you're not familiar with where to find those on our website, you know, shoot us an email uh, and we can point you in the right direction there. All right, let's get back on track uh, with some other uh, trade set uh, or some other charts here on the Paper Money account. All right, let's see here what we've got next. Um, let's come on over here now to um, some 12 grid analysis. And so let's do chart 5A, and this is our asset class 12 grid. 
Also, while this is getting pulled up here, um, I, I wanted to point out that I did make a pretty major update to chart 1A for those of you that are part of my Monday top-down trend trading class. So notice the new date of 426 in there. That's as a result of me um, hard coding uh, all of those new 28 stocks that I added to the Market Scholars 1000 into the relative strength line. So uh, be aware of that in case uh, you weren't in class the other day to, to hear me uh, mention that as well. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and take a look here at our, our 12 grid that we've got pulled up on chart 5A. This will be our asset class 12 grid. And this helps us try to you know determine whether we have uh, bullish or bearish postures using the market forecast um, technical indicator, in particular, the intermediate line. And you'll notice that if the background colors are green, like many of these on the top row are, that means what we have a strongly bullish posture. If the background colors are light green, like we have with Bitcoin and with uh, the 10-year treasury yield, that means we have a weakly bullish posture. If we have a dark pink background like we do with the US dollar, that's a strongly bearish posture. And if we have a light pink background like we do with foreign bonds, that's a weakly bearish posture. So we actually have all four color combinations uh, here that you can see in front of you. Now, when we're looking at these various charts, obviously they're all gonna look a little different. Some of them are gonna look like stronger trends, others less so. Um, and so it's a way to kind of hone in and, and refine uh, the postures a little bit better when you're looking at them with, with the naked eye. And you can see up at the top, the S&P 500 and EFA both have very strong trends right now. So large cap stocks in the United States and stocks that are considered in the developed foreign countries like Europe and Australia and Japan, et cetera, uh, continue to do pretty well. Emerging market stocks, on the other hand, have not been doing quite as well. However, they've stopped going down. So you know that's at least the, the first thing that you can ask a chart that was in a downtrend to do is stop going down first, and then maybe you have a chance to go up. And that's kind of where we're at with the emerging markets right now. It's nice to see them staying above that moving average for the last couple of weeks, and we'll see if they can build upon that going forward. Notice down below here, the US dollar uh, closed yesterday with an oversold cluster signal. Those are pretty rare, and so that's something worth paying attention to. We might be trying to establish some sort of a support right here where we bounce up and away from that green dot. Um, now at that point, our assumption is not that we have a trend uh, change on our hands. Instead, our assumption is that we have a reversion to the mean type of a move, and then we gotta play it by ear once we get up to that moving average right there, if we get there. Uh, because a lot of times we'll have a, maybe a week or two of a reversion to the mean move, and then it uses that downward trending moving average in this case as resistance rolls over and continues in that downtrend. But this is kind of like a, you know, a momentary reprieve, a, j a get out of jail free card type of a situation where uh, you might expect some sort of a bounce here. Remember, this one went in fact, it doesn't even show it on here, but I remember this was the one that we said before had an oversold cluster signal that called the bottom back here. You can't see it because it's been more than three months now, but um, had you bought that original um, green dot and then you wrote it to this red dot, which is the overbought cluster signal, and then you were able to um, sell it up here, you could actually be buying it back right here. In fact, let me do this. I'm pretty sure this was the chart, but just let me check my memory here. Yeah, that was it. So um, here's a six month view of it as opposed to the three month view. So had you bought UUP right here on this oversold cluster signal, that was the low in the move. You buy it there, you sell it here when you're getting this overbought cluster signal, or maybe you short it up here, and now you buy it back or you buy it for the first time once again here yesterday. Right, so that move worked out pretty nicely there. It doesn't always work out that way, uh, but right now it's, it's played out uh, pretty good there for that particular indicator. So we'll see if we've got some sort of a reversion to the mean type of a move coming up here on UUP. Remember, that's not the most exciting security to trade, but it does have reverberations across a lot of other markets like commodities and foreign securities, uh, et cetera. Uh, real quick, I did wanna point out, uh, gold was down a hair today, not much, Oil was up pretty nicely today, up 1.8% there. Both of them have strongly bullish uh, intermediate postures at a time when the US dollar has a strongly bearish intermediate posture. Also, I wanted to point out here that uh, treasury yields rose today. Remember, they've been struggling in recent weeks. Today was a pretty nice bounce back 
um, we were we finished on the 10 year at 1.62 percent and of course that means the flip side of that bonds were down today and we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a moment but before we do let me also show you what's been going on with the um, the sectors here today so chart 5c will give us that uh, sectors 12 grid where the chart in the upper left is the s p 500 and then all the rest of the 11 charts will be the 11 sectors that make up the s p 500. now as we're looking at this you can see that we have a few pink charts on the board now, remember last week when i was doing the analysis it was only energy that was the pink chart these charts on the bottom were green at the time. So things have changed a little bit here for the staples and the utilities. We've now had four straight down days for the staples. We've actually had five straight down days for the utilities. And because of that loss of momentum, notice that the upper reversal zone has been breached to the downside. In other words, we were above 80 a week ago on both of these on the intermediate line. Now the intermediate line is falling and at 78 on the staples and falling and at 76 on the utility. So we've effectively cracked below that upper reversal zone and that's why that background color of the chart is now pink, stating that we have a weekly bearish intermediate posture. However, I wouldn't be willing to give up on the trade so quickly. In other words, you'll notice that both of these sectors still have green moving averages, suggesting that price is above a rising moving average. So while it's true, the last week in both of those have been pretty ugly all of a the sudden, um, they are still in um, reasonably strong uptrends there. So maybe just a little bit of a breather after going up so significantly in the last month or two. But we'll keep our eye on that right now. Just know that there's been a little bit more wear and tear on the, on the staples and on the utilities. In terms of uh, who the best performer was on the, on the group here today, it was the financials. Again, that ties back to what I just mentioned a moment ago. Interest rates rose significantly today. Remember, on the whole, when interest rates rise, that benefits the financials and it disadvantages the utilities. So we see that relationship kind of holding true today as the utilities were down 0.77% and uh, financials were up 0.79%, almost uh, a 180 degree difference from one another uh, right there. So uh, anyway, and there's been some interesting dividend increase announcements uh, as well within the uh, financial space. We talked about a few of them in my dividend growth investing class today. You know, stocks like um, Ameriprise Financial and People's Bank both came out with uh, dividend increase announcements. Uh, stocks like IBM and Raytheon also came out with increase announcements. Obviously, they're not financials, but uh, we've been seeing a few more of those dividend increase announcements announcements and I've been trying to tweet those out to those of you that care about that sort of thing over on my Twitter timeline if you're interested there uh, as well. By the way, uh, my class earlier today, the Dividend Growth Investing class, is posted to our calendar. If you're interested in checking out um, a head-to-head -head competition within the uh, industrial sector, I presented two companies today that some folks had never heard of before. So uh, we're in a peculiar time for dividend growth investing where there's not a whole lot of value out there because the stock stock market is near all-time highs. So we're kind of dabbling with maybe some second-rate uh, companies, not to say that they're bad, just to say uh, that they're not the traditional blue chips that we usually look at. So if that spurs your interest, make sure you watch that recording from earlier today. And David taught his directional option strategy class earlier today as well. Tomorrow, I've got my factor-based swing trading, where we've locked in a couple of strong uh, swing trading wins here in the last couple of days that we'll talk about. And then David will be uh, teaching his advanced options class tomorrow afternoon. All right, let's get into our trade application example now. And for that, I'm just going to pull up chart um, 4A, just a market forecast one grid in this case. And I'm going to pull up ticker symbol TLT. Now, this should be a familiar ticker symbol to those of you that have watched this video over time because this is one of the, the main um, asset classes that we track on our 12 grid. Um, and so I actually did a bull put spread on TLT today. And again, just like I mentioned before, I've already sent out the, uh, the screenshots and the no notifications and everything to those of you that are premium members. So that way you can consider the trades while the market is open. Some of you might be looking at this chart and wondering, why are you interested in a bullish trade here? After all, uh, weren't you just taking bearish trades on this a few months ago? And the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, I, I still do not like TLT for the long term. Um, however, I do think this is an interesting time to consider uh, a bullish trade 
in the near term. And the reason for that is the, um, is, the, is the setup that exists here on the market forecast technical indicator. This will be an important kind of compare and contrast to what I mentioned to you at the beginning of tonight's video when we were talking about the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite both having what's known as bullish intermediate confirmation signals. Well, TLT does as well. The difference here is where the blue line is positioned. So notice that the green line is in the upper reversal zone telling us that we have a strongly bullish uh, intermediate posture. That's what the background color of the chart in dark green is also telling us there. In addition to that, we have a red line that's in the lower reversal zone here today. So that combination creates a bullish intermediate confirmation signal. And again, that's a buy the dip signal. And in order to look at it in a more ideal form, as I mentioned before, where we don't see it with the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite, we do see it here with TLT, which is an ETF that tracks the long US government bonds. And you can see that the blue line is positioned nicely between 50 and 20. So there's been a healthier pullback here where if you're gonna buy the dips, this is actually the third straight down day for TLT. So you're feeling like you're getting a little bit more bang for your buck by doing a bullish trade down here as opposed to doing it at its highs here a few days ago. So what I'm looking at here is not necessarily some sort of a major rebound back to the upside with this trade. Remember when we do a bull put spread, it's a neutral to bullish trade. It's not a wildly bullish trade. All we need and all we require is for the, for the stock, or in this case, the, the bond ETF, not to break down in a major way. Um, I think the, uh, the, the strikes that uh, were a part of that particular uh, trade that I did were the 134s that I sold and the 133s that I bought. And so in other words, we just need this security to stay above 134. And uh, whether it gets there by going sideways, going up, or even going lower, but just not falling, you know, four and a half bucks from where we're at right now, um, that will be uh, good enough in my book. So I'm not looking at this as an aggressive bullish trend or anything along those lines. I just think of it as a unique moment in time where you might see a little hem and haw between the financial markets. I mentioned before the sell in May and go away concept when it comes to the stock market. Well, remember, sometimes the bond market acts uh, inversely to the stock market. Sometimes market participants uh, you know, extract money from their riskier assets and put it into US government bonds. So that might help support this particular trade in the near term. And again, I wanna stress, this is not me saying I wanna be long uh, bonds for the long term. It's just that in this unique moment in time in the short term, uh, I think that there is a, an ability for this chart to kind of hold at these levels in the coming month or so. And this is a way to kind of uh, benefit from that by selling the 134, 133 bull put spread, okay? So that's what I had for you here today. If you got value out of the analysis here tonight, as always, we ask one and only one thing for you or from you is just simply click like for us there uh, on Twitter if you want us to continue to do these videos as often as we do. We really appreciate that. Uh, I will look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Tomorrow, David will be back in the saddle and uh, you'll have to look forward to his excellent analysis after the FOMC meeting. So until next time, I wanna wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.